you want to work your way to Acts chapter 20, starting with verse 28, <clears throat> I, I won't get there immediately, but I'll get there. You know, when they talked about a conference theme, uh, my inner being welled up with the idea, hindsight, 2020. You know, you guys reacted the same way the committee did. Well, okay, union with Christ is better, but if you'll notice, my sermons have been about hindsight. <laughs> so, um, I, I would like to, uh, being a 25th anniversary type thing, just kind of share a few thoughts about uh, where we've been, and what we see on the horizon. Uh, and, and Jeremiah, I will use a caveat that uh, you made in a sermon a couple of weeks ago. Man plans his, uh, makes his plans and God orders his steps. So I think it's right for us to make our plans, but when God orders our steps the other way, it's a good time to move. <laughs> so uh, that... that I, and I want to preface anything I make about the future is that I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. I'm not a gun either or the son of a gun. Okay, um, you may not know that uh, this conference uh, uh, developed out of a national conference of its type, and we are more uh, an image of them. Uh, several of us from the Midwest got, went regularly and annually, and uh, oddly enough, it started in the same place that I was doing doctoral work at the same time I was there doing doctoral work, and I missed every one of them. And it was sheer pig-headedness on my part. I don't really recall refusing to go. I just don't remember being asked, but I'm sure I was. You can't be around Pat Stewart and not be asked, you know, so... Uh, However, when I got to Missouri Baptist the next year, they hired a history guy, and he invited me to the Founders Conference. Now, I was in the throes of dissertation, and the administration was pressing on me to actually graduate. <laughs> you know, ABD, all but dead. <laughs> so I, I just kind of begged off and said, uh, maybe next year, let me try to graduate this year. And of course, uh, if you know anything about Terry Crisp, that means he's going to ask you the next year. And he did, and I said, okay, well, I'm not going to fight it. Uh, I found, uh, for me, an experience at the Founders Conference is that <clears throat> I walked away feeling about that intelligent and that spiritual. That I was challenged at my understanding of Christianity and my practice of it. And the two were not divorced, they were heavily wedded. Well, uh, several of us began to believe that there would be people in this area who would never go to a national conference, either because they don't want to travel that far, or they don't, want to, they don't have the kind of money to spend, or whatever. And so uh, four of us met, the, at least in my history of the thing, uh, four of us met in uh, Hannibal LaGrange, and it was Dick Todd, who is still with us, Mar Marvin Jones, He's still alive, he's just not with us. <laughs> he moved. Um, Terry Crisp and myself, Terry and I drove up to Hannibal. Uh, we met in the good old Baptist place like Denny's and uh, had what uh, John Hefflinger calls belly ship. <laughs> and, and we just talked about what we thought and we prayed. So the very next... Uh, Founders Conference, somebody said, I don't know who, whose idea it was, if you're interested in a conference like this in the Midwest, come to a meeting at lunch. And so, you know, Baptist meetings, I like that. Lunch, okay, two for one. So I, I recognized there was a good group of folks there, and I thought to myself, logically, the first thing to do is to structure a committee. How can I stay off the committee? You know, the, the, the best way is to not be there, right? Well, I figured the second best was to nominate everybody else. So I started nominating somebody, 
And they got quiet. I nominated somebody else, and it got quiet. I nominated somebody else, and so he says, why don't you get on it? So I'm on the committee now. We got together here locally, and I thought to myself, okay, I got myself in trouble with my big mouth. Maybe I'll stay out of the, I mean, what is the committee first thing that every committee does when they're brand new? They elect a chairman, and I don't want to be the chairman. I just keep my mouth shut this time instead of pushing somebody else. It didn't matter what I wanted. So I ended up being the chairman, and uh, one of the student workers that helped me the most that first year was Phil Auxier. He just uh, f- Facebooked me uh, yesterday. He says, it's been 25 years. I can still remember scurrying all over St. Charles trying to get stuff to get ready for that. And uh, the Lord has blessed us for these 25 years. We have tried uh, generally to have two sermons that were biblical theology in nature, two that were historical theology in nature, two that were systematic theology in nature, and two that were practical theology. Now, the, the rib on that is, is that most of the practical theology ones came out of a strong sense of biblical theology and you can't really talk biblical theology and preach it without getting a little practical from time to time. There's nothing wrong with being practical. It's pragmatism that kills us. Being impractical just lets us stumble. So um, we've seen that mission hold out. We, we kind of broke track when we did Jonathan Edwards' birthday and uh, Reformation Day in Wittenberg. We probably did something about Calvin. I've got notes on it, so, you know, here's that there. Uh, we, we wanted to shock everybody and bring up the C word, Calvin, <laughs> and show them it doesn't really hurt and the sky doesn't fall in yet. And uh, so over the 25 years, obviously we've had 25 themes. We've had, uh, by the end of this, or this presentation, 200 sermons. And the good news is, is that you can go on our website and click on the word videos, and it'll give you a, a sub-menu by 10-year groupings, and you pick your 10 years, it'll give you another sub-menu for all those years. You pick a year, it'll give you the conference theme and the eight, uh, a video of the eight sessions. There, there are a couple of problems. We have uh, one session, one of the 2,000-year, uh, the camera thing didn't work out for us, and so it's got audio. So, But you know, you can listen to Al Mohler as good as you can watch him, so, because he's that good. That wasn't a slam. You have to explain this to some Baptist. Um, not you. I'm just using you as a foil. Um, <clears throat> during that time, we had uh, uh, around 40 guest speakers and 45 local speakers. I would like to share with you, uh, as I looked back, I, I found a mistake I made, but it is regarding with two different people. For, I don't know, 20 more of the sermon presentations, every time I planned something, I could see Joe Braden and John Griever preaching it. And I, I knew if I did that every year, they'd kill me, and everybody else would. You show in favoritism. No, I just like them better. <clears throat> now, the mistake came in that in trying not to overuse them, I forgot to use them entirely. And that's my sheer stupidity. We've been in three different churches. We started off in... Uh, Waypoint Baptist Church now. It was First Baptist Church uh, Harvester. The pastor was a friend, but he was not an attender. He would come and welcome us, and that's pretty much the last time we saw him. That's okay. We can live with that. I think we were there about three times. And then when uh, uh, Joe Braden became pastor at First St. Peter's, we moved there, and the Church of St. Peter's adopted us. And I have to tell you, in those interim years, he wouldn't admit it, 
But Joe Braden carried, carried a yeoman's task in the organization and planning of all that. And I was glad to see him here yesterday. And I told him what I was going to tell him. So if you tell him something other than what I told him, which is what I just said, God will get you. I won't. <laughs> uh, so over these years, we've seen uh, coming here now, this is our fifth year here, fourth year here. Time, have, time, time does go fast. Um, we had a much more active committee, which is a good thing. We've got some more active young folks. I'd like to see them bring their friends, each one bring one, <laughs> just because uh, some of us are getting gray. And, uh, you know, what's after gray is gone. So, and we know some of us that have done that too. So, I, I think that's a good thing to see uh, a discipleship process that uh, purposely brings in uh, the men of quality as they've grown up. And uh, I, I am extremely proud of uh, Dr. Wilson and soon to be in the years coming Dr. Griever as he's working on his D-men. They have been uh, exemplary in their preparation and yet humble in their discussion with each other and, and with us and all of us. And it's been, uh, I think of these four years though, the workhorse is still Terry Coker. Uh, you know, it, it just, it's just incredible. If I, could, if I could put into words all the things he did, we would be here until next year. And Terry, you have my sincere thanks. And I know a lot of people would thank you if they knew. And no, he won't give you a refund at this point. Okay, so that's kind of the blessings of the past. What do I see for the opportunities for the future? First one is really more an issue of logistics. Last summer, we had a conference call with uh, the leaders of the national conference and leaders of the other various regional conferences. And they shared with us that they had had a consultant come in and kind of give them some advice to better maximize their social media and various other stuff, including branding. And they told us that they wanted to go to kind of a more unified approach instead of a decentralized approach. And so we began to ask them, what does that mean? And they basically said, oh, I'm not really sure. <laughs> so does that mean this, does that mean this? And so uh, I told them, and we told them, could you give us grace since we've got this one planned? And it's the 25th anniversary, we're your oldest group. We have the coolest logo of all the rest of them, you know, so uh, they very generously and, and I got to meet with Tom Askell last May at the Founders Conference, and we talked for an hour and really came to the conclusion that we were not sure what we were talking about. Uh, the committee has a mind to keep the charm of a local church and a local venue and a, a local body that kind of sets the agenda. But at the same time, we don't want to be so on our own that we don't uh, call the national guys and consult with them and get their okay and that kind of stuff. Uh, there's some issues that are for us easy to turn over. There's some issues for us that are not quite so easy. Uh, the national group has already told us that if we want to change our name and go on our way, it's no harm, no foul. They won't think the less of us. Uh, but we really don't want to do that. Uh, are, are we all things that every founders that you ever met is? No. no we're still Baptist. That means we have three opinions on every issue. Uh, but if you find out in the coming uh, months, Israel just got down on Judah. <laughs> Sorry. Brother, we've all been, we've all parents, so go on. You know, they, nowadays, modern churches have crying rooms. 
We used to call them the bathroom. <laughs> where your mother showed you that if you really want to cry, I'll give you a good excuse. <clears throat> As a preacher's kid, I really didn't like it when my dad did it. We didn't go to the bathroom. We went to his office. It was more soundproof. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much sound there is. When you come out red-faced with bloodshot eyes, they're pretty well sure of what happened. You go wash your face. Like, That's going to change things. Um, so if you see us uh, adopting a national logo or a different logo or a different name or a more unified name, don't be surprised. Don't, don't be taken aback. If they want us to channel all of our social media to their social media and we agree to do that, don't be surprised. Although I think it's better for them that we're out there because we become another hub for, for p passing them along the way, but we'll talk about all that. Uh, we have told the National Conference that... Uh, we see ourselves as men under authority. You, you uh, gave us permission to start. We asked. They gave us permission to start. They gave us some money to start. They helped us out. Uh, they've been good to us all the way, and we've tried to be good to reporting to them uh, and sending them copies of the tapes and all this other stuff. So I think we have a good relationship, and it's just a matter of uh, negotiation, I guess, as it, uh, between friends and brothers. So if, if things look the same, remember it's exactly the same, only different. The other thing I'd like to say about the future, and, and this may be a, a matter of age, because when, when you go through a, a, a denominational type struggle and the thought processes that go through it, when a different one comes about, you start seeing similarities. And you realize no one's told the younger guys what we had to do. And so I would like to talk about lessons from the past that help us for the challenges of the future. So I'm going to talk more about modernity than postmodernity. But since postmodernity is modernity on steroids, it, it's, it's not a far leap. I would like to read to you our scripture verse. In Acts 20, Paul is on his way back to Jerusalem on his third missionary journey. He's stopping at key points to say goodbye to everyone. He is now here at Miletus, where he's asked the Ephesian elders to come down and to talk with them and to pray with them. And of all the admonition he gave them, he gives them this charge starting in verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Be alert. Well, I'd like to share a few things that have been both a blessing and a challenge uh, as I've dealt with the evil of the age uh, in my life. I think C.S. Lewis was the first one to draw my attention to the fact that we have allowed ourselves into the wrong battle. The, the world around us wants us to battle between our minds and our hearts. However, when they talk about our hearts, they really mean our stomachs. They're talking about our base passions, not our passion for truth. And so when you watch a Hallmark movie, any one of them, and somebody says, you've got to learn to think with your heart, you, you should stand up and say, no, think with your stomach. Well, it sounds a little more crude, but I mean, it's way ahead of the bowels of compassion. So, what C.S. Lewis tried to say is that really, the heart is for those convictions around truth 
that help your mind to comprehend the world and keep your mind from going off on a wild uh, hare uh, march and also control your passions. They will not eradicate your passions. They will fuel them, but they will also guide them because passions are not good at leading. They lead you astray. But they're terrific followers. And so C.S. Lewis kind of helped me to to modulate this idea of there is a a truth-based, for Christians, a truth-based Christianity that is both objective in its uh, articulation and subjective in that it is the person of Christ. So having Christ dwell in your heart is a way of pulling reins on your brain and your stomach that they may be conformed to his work and his will. Uh, If you want to read C.S. Lewis on this, uh, I I basically got this out of uh, Men Without Chest, which is the first chapter in The Abolition of Man. If you go to C.S. Lewis uh, Lewis Doodle on uh, YouTube, they they have a guy that's drawing this all out while someone's reading it. And uh, I don't know what kind of learning style is my best one, but I I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm in touch with my uh, more cartoonish side anyway. But as we boil this down, we recognize that this very substance, this very body of truth, this very guideline is not just what is a, a good governor for me, it is also what makes up culture. That the things that a culture agrees on to help them understand and shape life and know where to go and where not to go, that that's what a culture does. And a cultural revolution is when the, the shared values are being pulled out and replaced with another set. And I think that, and, and, and here again, this is where we've not armed our society, much less our churches, to connect the dots. We talk about a Christian worldview, but how many people know what it is? And if they could articulate it, which most of them can't, they don't really know how it relates to anything, which is on us too, because we need to exegete the society as well as the people when using scripture. So in my world, secularism stepped into this process and its its contribution to this culture change was to say, religion has no voice. Religious institutions, religious ideas, don't tell me what the Bible says, I don't believe it. I always wanna say, well of course you don't believe it, that's why you're an unbeliever. But they want to silence our voice. They, they're not going to cover you right in the media. They're not going to do this. They're not going to do that. That shouldn't surprise us. Jesus said the world hates him. Anybody who loves the world is not of him. So, you know, let's move along on that one. The, the problem, though, is when you, re, when you take all religious ideas out, you end up vindicating pretty much everything. So if everybody's right according to their own conscience, then nobody does anything they're ashamed of. And Ravi Zacharias points out that secularism has left our culture with a loss of shame. Now for those of you who are postmodern or moving in that realm, if you'll watch today, a new sense of shame is being entered into our cultural talk. Because, the tra- because uh, relativism is a, a transition from one group to another. The new order is starting to take its place and it's shaming people by its own standards so that you don't have to prove that somebody is a way, a certain way. All you gotta do is call them a name, they're done. That means by, by birthright, I'm a misogynist. 
I thought that meant I liked massages, but <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> well, along with secularism, pluralism itself has come in. And pluralism is, is, because it's transitional, it doesn't want to give favor to anybody. Well, the problem with that is, is that there are views that are conflicting. You, you cannot be a Christian and a Hindu. It just doesn't work. They are contradictory. However, with pluralism, they have to both be right. Which means that you have to lose any sense of reason. You give over your right to think. And that is a great loss. So in America, we don't teach our kids to think. We teach them to solve problems. We don't teach them to think for themselves and to think well. And the biggest rule of reason that they hate is the rule of non-contradiction. I always love uh, Ravi Zacharias' illustrations of these. I won't give them all to you. But he was telling this guy who was arguing for both Christianity and Hinduism that that was an Eastern way of thinking. And he says, i got to tell you, in India, it's either the bus or us. We look both ways before we cross the street because we can't be both us and the bus. Uh, he even told the guy, so you're telling me if I don't do both and, I'm wrong. That's either or. So pluralism takes our loss of shame, robs us of any reasoning power, particularly to say, okay, because I believe this, that means I don't believe this. And if you noticed that, uh, whether it's the statement on inerrancy, the various statements that have come out from various groups of evangelicals, they, they will have, we believe this, therefore we deny this, and we deny this. Because they want to give it shape. They want to tell their society, a belief has some consequences. That means we reject this and this. Which is what the Lord told us to do. To use sound doctrine and confront those who reject it. Well, if you add to that privatization, that is that if you do want to have religion and you do want to have your own worldview, you can do that at home as long as you don't bring it out to play with you. Don't bring it out in public, just keep it at home. The problem with that is, is that you have to squash any sense of significance. Okay, um, I have been fans of different teams at different times for different reasons. But I do return back to that five-pointed star that's blue etched in gray uh, associated with Dallas. Uh, and my cowboys have gone long ago. That's fine. I saw Roger Stahl back the other day and said to myself, we're getting old. But you know, I'll never be a Steelers fan. I don't hate Steelers fans. I don't have any truck with Steelers fans. The only time I'm ever going to root for the Steelers is if they're going to beat up on the Patriots. And you know, I was never a Rams fan until they came here. And I really like the greatest show on turf. But I think the Rams can go off of the West Coast now. Because they're not just the stinking Rams. They're the traitorous stinking Rams. Okay. Now, I know that's silly, but the point is, is that when something means something to you, it's significant to you, you don't leave it at home in the closet. I'm constantly talking about my wife, and I try to mostly say good things because we get in the track of saying bad things, but the truth is I treasure her. She's a joy to me. I'm not going to not talk about her because that could be religious. Keep that at home. So modernism has already attacked that core belief that defines us and is very soon to replace it with its own likes and dislikes. And when it does so, it will do so with great rule, force, and tyranny. Because the other lesson from history is relativism leads to tyranny. And who knows, we may give up our, our freedom.
to maintain our safety. Okay, that is one lesson from the past, and it's more of a cultural one than a religious one. I would like to share with you, secondly, from Thomas Oden, who uh, wrote a terrific little chapter. Uh, the, the book was No God But God, and he wrote Not Whoring After the Spirit of the Age, and he really outlined some things that are terrific and they're worth going over, and, and he gave us really two two ideas about why modernity is not going to work. <clears throat> the first point is that modernity is bankrupt. <laughs> it does not deliver what it promises. Postmodernity will be in heavily debt. It believes, you know, that you can borrow your way into prosperity, <clears throat> to quote a former president. And so where modernity has this autonomous individual Postmodernity will, on the one hand, exas exaggerate that for them, but not for you. And we've watched uh, the world seen as the left have become worse than left. Uh, uh, Dennis Prager says there's the left and there's the liberal, and the liberal is far more patriotic than the left. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, great. <laughs> so uh, he outlines that autonomous individualism, narcissistic hedonism, reductive naturalism, Dr. Crisp, and absolute moral relativism. I think we're going to watch a day when the same arguments for those are going to, we're going to have excessive narcissism. Take our churches. We went through a two-decade process to make sure the church was so user-friendly. We picked our songs because that's what the lost like to hear. We picked our sermons because that's what the lost like to hear. We gave away the gospel because the lost doesn't want to hear it. And we essentially worshiped the lost. Well, a lot of those lost people became church members. I got to tell you something. They expect to still be worshiped. And if you don't sing the kind of music that makes them stand up and shout, they don't want to come. Well, you know, when you became a church member without repenting of your sin, of course you're not going to want to repent of your sin now. <laughs> I didn't get in that way, so why do I got to practice that way? It reminds me in Pilgrim's Progress when they ran into Mr. Ignorant because he came his own way. He wasn't ignorant because he was stupid. He was ignorant because he wasn't submissive. He didn't come the way the Lord told him. He did it on his own. And you know where he ended up? Not in the celestial city. Okay? Just enough enough. So uh, modernism, as it's more and more bankrupt, but, but it does serve us this one warning. And that is that when we accommodate to the evil of the age, it's suicide. If we say we're going to give up a little here so that we have a seed of power so we can influence folks, we are fooling ourselves. Because we will have, if we actually obtain any power at that seat, we'll have given up so much of the gospel that we won't have anything to bring to the table. And they may like us for numbers, but that's about it. And so that perpetual push to accommodate to the world is still seen. Uh, it's, it's a service by the fact that we don't educate ourselves even to think philosophically or properly. <clears throat> Many times in our discussions, you can tell we, we take <clears throat> their, their, their assumptions as a part of the argument instead of refuting them. And even worse than that, we have, <clears throat> what is it, Timothy George called it, historical myopia. We don't understand our roots in classical evangelicalism. Did you know that for 2,000 years, the Orthodox Church, all Orthodox churches believed about 80% of the same thing? That means we're all variations on a kind. You'd never know it. But when we start losing to 80%, and it gets down to 15 and 10 and 12, we're no longer variations of a kind. We're just mixed breeds. 
And so Thomas Oden suggests these uh, three remedies. First of all, he said, listen to the scripture text itself. I want to add to that, resist adding to that. (laughs) Have you noticed how many times we end up talking about things that are in between the lines? In my Bible, there is no writing between the lines. That's why they're lines. So when you read between the lines, it pretty much says, many times in a narrative, he just tells you what happens. He doesn't condemn it. He doesn't celebrate it. And sometimes we take it off on a tangent, do our own celebration, our own condemnation, and call that biblical preaching. That's not, that's isogenical preaching. And without being too superlative, we all do it. (laughs) I guess that's more hyperbolic, isn't it? Which leads me to my next point. Brothers and sisters, let's leave off the superlatives for a while. I I challenge the pulpit pastor in his mind to keep track of every time he says, this is the most important scripture passage I've ever preached on. Now, Uh, Am I confessing my own sin? Well, sure I am. (laughs) How do you think I know? (laughs) I don't pay attention to you guys. I don't get to hear you. (laughs) Except Jeremiah, who does not range in the superlatives, even if it is the best thing he's ever thought of. You know, when you listen to the scripture text, David Dockery called it submissive hermeneutics. I want to know what this text means without me adding anything to it so that it can disciple me and I can understand my world by its terms. I can interpret life differently because the Bible has given me new eyes to see. And you have to let the text dictate that because if you manipulate the text, you lose the ability to do that. My contention is this. I don't know what it takes to be conformed to the image of Christ. The Bible does. I don't have the power to move my heart in life that way. The Bible shows me how. Maybe I need to be under it. And that's something we all need to work on and encourage each other to. Thomas Oden, who was a rank liberal in his own life and came back to classical Christianity... He said, I made a commitment to make no new contribution to theology. He said, I want that on my gravestone. He made no contribution, new contribution to theology. I don't want to come up with a new theology. I want to understand the old better. His last suggestion was, we should reacquaint ourselves with the classical Christian writers of our faith. And by this, He's basically giving you a piece of advice that he got from a Jewish mentor, and that was, you really don't know Christianity until you've read the guys who died for the privilege. Read the church fathers, the guys who were putting their life out on the line to write what they wrote. They were the ones who, though he cursed me, I will trust him. And he said, when I read them, I went from a guy who did not trust anybody over 30 to a guy that doesn't trust anybody under 300. Well, we see that modernity and now post-modernity attacks the base of our thinking. It infiltrates our churches through this kind of accommodation sickness. But that means that at the end of it all, it will end up affecting our view of missions. When I was a young professor, my major professor put out a collection of chapters under the, guy, under the heading of uh, authority and interpretation, a biblical perspective. In that book, uh, Tom Nettles argued that the inerrancy debate, uh, he, he, he had a something old, something new, he didn't bar, do bar to blue. He said the old thing is the argument. The things that have been against inerrancy, the things that are for inerrancy, they've been in every church age, and he clocked that out. 
He said, the new thing is, is that instead of being apologist against critics, it's one set of Christians arguing with another set of people who call themselves Christians. Through chapters down the line, the guy wrote a chapter on missions. One of the things he did for me that has helped me very much is he put up a chart that he got from, I think it's Daniel uh, Besh, and he added one on the end himself. And he was talking about how missions actually split into ecumenical and evangelical, read conservative, liberal, if you like. And they, they have their own conferences starting at a certain point in time, and they still do that. And so he, he split certain ideas to kind of give you a side-by-side -side of uh, ecumenical and evangelical, and I will share some, some of them with you. The ecumenical uh, shows a preference for Jesus' language of the Gospels. The evangelical show, shows a preference for Paul's language in the epistles. The ecumenical begins with human disorder. The evangelical begins with God's design. The ecumenical stresses unity at the expense of truth. The evangelical stresses truth at the expense of unity. The ecumenical believes that God reveals himself through contemporary experience. The evangelical believes that God reveals himself only through Jesus Christ and in the scriptures and the church. The ecumenical emphasizes the deed or the praxi. The evangelical emphasizes the word orthodoxy. The ecumenical regards social involvement as part and parcel or even all of the Christian mission. The evangelical regards social involvement as a separate from missions or as a result of conversion issue. The ecumenical views, uh, excuse me, judges societal ethics to be of prime importance. The ecumenical judges personal ethics to be of prime importance. The ecumenical views sin as having a corporate dimension. Evangelicals view sin as an exclusively individual issue. And uh, that's eight out of 23. I have them all written down here, but I'm sure you don't really care to be read to all that. It should not then uh, surprise us that the world doesn't agree with us. What should surprise us is that we agree with the world far too much. Um, I'm not going to read it to you. I was going to, but I won't. There's a, a beautiful poem by Rudyard Kipling, not exactly the greatest proponent of Christianity one way or the other, I guess, but it's called uh, The Gods of the Copyright Headings. And in his day, school kids would have kind of a, as a copyright thing at the head of, or tail of their papers, Bible verses or maxims or proverbs. And so what he does is he pits the gods of the copyright headings, truth, with the gods of the marketplace. And he essentially says that the gods of the marketplace capture our attention. They inspire our souls. They lift us up. Except they're wrong. It's the gods of the copyright headings, you know, things like uh, if he does, if the wages of sin is death. If you don't earn, eat, don't work, you don't eat. Better the, devil you, work, better the devil you know. All that glitters is not gold. Two and two is four. Boring. Of course, the sinners. And he continues to show how they promised this. They, they, they promised that if we put down our arms, we'd have peace. When we laid down our guns, they tied us up and sold us to the, our enemies. When, it, when they told us that we should love our neighbor and ended up loving our neighbor's wife, <laughs> we end up really loving nobody and so on. Uh, it, 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 the, I got onto this because of Jeopardy. They had this particular clue, and the, the words caught my fancy. When we uh, rob individual Peter to pay corporate Paul. We find out that we don't have, we have lots of things we can buy, but we don't have the money. We have lots of money to buy things, we just don't have anything to buy. And uh, he keeps coming back to the, the tyranny of the gods of the copyright headings because they keep smashing us 
into reality. And just as it did happen to rationalism, empiricism, postmodernism, naturalism, and all the other things, reality will one day crash in on us. And the gospel will still be there. And the Lamb will always be the glory in Emmanuel's land because that's reality. For the Christian, we don't see truth as tyrannical. We see it as precious. Not because we're so smart, but because we're so blessed. And I think that many times you hear almost the same discussion today that you heard 20 years ago. It's just a different topic. I would admonish you as our dear brother has. Look to the lessons of the past for the challenges of the future. Because God has equipped us and he has come to redeem us from the present evil age. And that started in the first century. So my dear brothers I pray, and sisters, I pray that you will all be back next year. Bring somebody with you. I'm not trying to do marketing. I just feel like there's something here that is a blessing to me. And I think it's a blessing to others. And I'd like to see them uh, enjoy that. Let's pray, and I'll turn it over to Jeremiah. We do thank you, Lord, for your sovereign goodness to us. We recognize our complete inability in so many things. But at the same time, we recognize your complete ability in everything. So I pray, Lord, help us uh, to stop wondering what you want to do with us in the future and fix our eyes upon you now and follow and depend and have those great supernatural occurrences that happen when your spirit is animating us. I ask you to do that in Jesus' name, amen.